Senator Baldwin. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank uh, all of our witnesses today for joining us. Um, like so many members of this committee, I'm concerned about new outbreaks and increasing cases. Certainly, I've seen them in my home state of Wisconsin, and I know we're seeing that nationally. Now, CDC and OSHA have issued uh, recommended safety guidance for businesses, um, but this guidance is not enforceable. Many businesses are truly trying to do the right thing and protecting workers and customers and the public that interacts with those businesses. Um, and so uh, we also had a previous discussion. I think uh, Senator Sanders raised the issue of uh, American Airlines filling up their planes versus others that are uh, still not trying to push to do so uh, because of safety concerns. We also had, uh, I think it was Admiral Girard, hold up the uh, uh, what he called critical guidance. Please follow this critical guidance. So, Dr. Redfield, should we be supporting businesses that have taken the steps to protect their workers and customers by fully implementing CDC's and OSHA's recommended safety guidance? Yes or no? Yes. Yes, we should be supporting those businesses. Now, can you confirm, yes or no, that all businesses have adopted and implemented this guidance as they've opened up? I think, Senator, you know that unfortunately that's not been the case. So it's an uneven playing field, and it hurts businesses that are trying to do the right thing by voluntarily adopting CDC and OSHA safety guidelines um, because their competitors don't have to incur the same safety and health costs. And if you believe that we should be supporting the good actors, then shouldn't we create a level playing field by issuing an emergency temporary standard to require all businesses to adopt and comply with enforceable safety standards? Let me make two comments, Senator. First one is so important that we've tried to say um, is that this is a time that everyone in our nation accept the responsibility that Dr. Fauci and I spoke about to recognize they have the fundamental responsibility not just to protect themselves, to protect others by the social distance, face mask, and hand washing. Um, secondly, uh, again, as we look at the local jurisdictions, again, to see where, in fact, that enforceability would be, whether it's in the local health department, the state health department, or the federal health department. I think, uh, again, uh, we see that the, the community can get behind that responsibility. Uh, those businesses that support that responsibility may find, in fact, their business is better than those businesses that don't. I can tell you that well, if I, I you... I want to interrupt you. Uh, I, I apologize, Dr. Redfield, um, but my time is limited. Um, the, uh, the panel right now is composed of people representing public health and uh, public health institutions. Um, OSHA is our lead federal agency uh, for protecting worker safety and health. Have you uh, had communication with the Department of Labor and OSHA about uh, issuing mandatory enforceable standards rather than this voluntary guidance? Um, uh, Secretary Scalia is a member of the uh, task force and he's in the discussions with us uh, that the vice president uh, uh, chairs um, that specific so answer, topic. Yes? We have not had a discussion directly, but we have had discussions and review of the guidance that we've put to uh, uh, businesses, both critical infrastructure and non-critical infrastructure businesses with uh, OSHA. Um, so uh, I, I have um, limited time left, but I do want to say that the University of Wisconsin announced that they will be reopening for classes in the fall. They've released a plan called Start, uh, Smart Restart. It calls for about 2,000 tests per week on campus. They'll need supplies to do this, including PPE, reagents, and swabs. At every hearing on COVID-19, we've heard about shortages of these supplies. And it's why I introduced the Medical Supply Transparency and Delivery Act to unlock the full authority of the Defense Production Act to increase production of critical supplies 
um, the things that are needed to conduct widespread testing. Admiral Giroir, can you describe how you're working to make sure that uh, universities and others will have access to these supplies needed to conduct this testing in the fall? So, th thank you so much, Senator. Um, and I want to communicate this, and I'm happy to work with any university. Um, we coordinate what we give to the states through the state plan. So it's very important that universities um, coordinate through the states, and we supply those materials directly to a single point of contact in the state who distributes them. Um, we, you know, we've been through a lot, but we have a lot of swabs now, uh, partially because of increased domestic production using the DPA. We're distributing about 20 million swabs per month. We're going to do a lot more than that. How about reagents? Um, so reagents we do not purchase centrally because the market is a little bit more mature, so we can trust with an allocation strategy that we allocate. We support the allocation to different states depending on their needs. So we've mapped every single machine in every single state, every single county, every single city. And unfortunately, there's not enough of one thing that everybody, if they want that, can get it. So we really do a matching game to understand specific state needs. For example, in Alaska, it is very rural and there's very limitations to what they have. So we need to make sure they get what they absolutely need versus other states that can be a little bit more flexible. So we do well, we have this control. Thank you very much. Yes, Senator, well, I'm afraid we're I'm so sorry. Well, well over well over time. We have a large number of senators who want to ask questions, so I would renew my Thank you, Mr. Chair. request that uh, senators and witnesses try to keep the questions and answers within within five minutes. 